to present, uh, we have a speaker. Uh, he's a registered um, TCM physician based in Singapore. So I'd like to invite Mr. Dr. Edward Yap to present on the topic, please. Uh, very good morning to each and every one of you here. So it's my honor to be here for the second day uh, to show you some of the development of uh, TCM. Okay, maybe uh, I will bring you all back to the first uh, evolution of the TCM, how it originated. So there will be some uh, flashback to the history. So uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, it dates back to uh, this uh, legendary period, which is somewhere around 2800 BC. That is called the Sen Nong period. Okay, in this period, there's this development of agriculture and the use of medicinal plant by this person called Sen Nong. He's a legend figure. So he's the one who actually start all this herbal treatment. So this is how it looks like. Okay, he's said to be the pioneer and creator of this herbal therapy. So during his time, little was known about which food and medicine could be used safely. So in order to help his people, he decided to taste hundreds of plants and record down which plants are nutritional, medicinal and poisonous. So he taught his people how to identify different kinds of plants and how to grow crops. Legend said that he has two horns on his head, you can see from there, and apart from his head and four limbs, his body is almost transparent. Therefore, one could see the effects of the different plants and herbs on his organs and body. He has also invented eggs, digging well, agricultural, irrigation, as well as acupuncture and moxibustions. However, he eventually died as a result of using his own body to experiment plants. And uh, one fine day, he ate a poisonous uh, yellow flower of a weed, and that caused his intestine to rupture. So this is a time of uh, the initial acupuncture needle. It's actually from this stone called bian shi. Bian means sharp, shi means stone. So these are the early days of acupuncture using stones and also moxibustions. So after the death of this Shen Nong, uh, there's another person by the name of Huang Di took over him. So this Huang Di is said to be somewhere from 2717 to 2599 BC. And he was a man of great wisdom. It was said that he was the first emperor to introduce wooden houses, bow and arrows, boats, wheel vehicles, writing and use of coins. He's credited to defeat the barbarians in a battle and the victory winning him the leadership of his tribes. Huang Ti's wife was said to discover silk production and to have taught women how to breed silkworms and weave fabrics of silk. So with regards to this Huang Ti, uh, he's associated with what we consider one of the most important ancient Chinese medicine texts, which is called the Inner Classic of Yellow Emperor, Huang Ti Neijing. And this text is a fundamental doctrine source for Chinese medicine. And in fact, this text is still uh, applicable in our modern society because this is one of the texts that we are studying in our TCM. And this, uh, this uh, Huang Ti Neijing is a very interesting text because it's uh, presented as a dialogue between the Yellow Emperor and one of his chief physicians called Qi Bo. So it'll be like a dialogue. So, uh, it's something like the Yellow Emperor will ask a question, then Chi Bo will answer accordingly. So it's a dialogue form, so it's more interesting. <clears throat> so if you want to know more about this legend, uh, you can actually go to this YouTube. There's one movie called The Ancient Legends. Uh, it's in Chinese. Uh, the Chinese title is called Yuan Gu De Chuan Shuo. Okay. So in, in this legend, you can see all these figures are inside. It's quite interesting.
Okay, so in this uh, Huang Di Nei Jing, basically it contains of two main texts. So each of 81 chapters. So under the first one, we call, the, we call it uh, Su Wen. Su Wen in, it translated is to be uh, basic questions. So in this uh, Su Wen, it contains the principle of Chinese medicine and the theory of your universe as it relates to the human health. So there are also a lot of uh, the Taoist philosophy inside as well. So in this uh, text, it talks about the yin-yang theory, the five elements, and related information in question and answer form on the pathology, signs, symptoms, cause of disease, whole body and environment. So you can find a lot of the principles of TCM in this Su Wen. And then the second text is called Ling Su, literally means magic gate. So it discusses uh, acupuncture in great details. So a lot of things, uh, if you want to know more about acupuncture, how you should do it, you know, and what kind of uh, way you should do it, it's all inside here. Then of course there's also some uh, compilation of this Sen Nong Pen Chao Jing, meaning all the herbs that is uh, discovered by Sen Nong is written here. But of course over the years there are also various scholars uh, also make some amendment and improve on it. So uh, there, was, there was a listing of about 365 herbal materials, plants, animals, minerals, uh, sources, and how, how, the, how the herbs are processed, mixed and formulated. <clears throat> so from the period of 221 BC to 1911 AD, there are a lot of development in terms of the Chinese medicines and a lot of uh, medical texts and treatises are written uh, in each dynasty, especially in those dynasties where it is uh, uh, supported by the emperors and uh, where dynasties that are more stable. Okay. So of all these uh, texts, uh, the following are the more important ones. So there's this text called Sang Han Zha Bing Lun, okay, Treatise of the Co-Pathogenic and Miscellaneous Diseases, written by Zhang Zhongjing in uh, 150 to 220 AD. Uh, this is a very classical dispensary handbook. It describes the sim symptoms of uh, differentiation, treatment, and the use of the medicine. Uh, they also have a, bit, a formula so this text, actually, we are also using it. And uh, a lot of research are being done on this uh, text. So together with Huang Di Nei Jing and Sang Han Lun, these two texts is just like the, the four tantras of the Tibetan medicine. So these two are also very important. So this Zhang, Sang Han Zha Bing Lun was later organized by another physician called Huang Su He in Qing Dynasty and later by various court physicians and it breaks down further into two sections. So the first book we, is called Sang Han Lun. So this was mainly a uh, discourse on how to treat epidemic infectious disease during fever uh, that is common in that era. And the other one is called Jing Gui Yao Lue, the second one. Basically, it's uh, uh, a clinical experience with regards to the internal diseases. So there are two sections in this book. Yeah? And we are, we are still studying all these books, and we are using the formulas in modern society. And uh, there's also another book called Tang Ben Chao. Okay, this was uh, uh, commissioned by the emperor during the Tang Dynasty and written by Su Jing and 23 other medical scholars. So all these are recorded and is considered the earlier medical text in the early days. So it consists of uh, 54 chapters, 850 herbal description and 20 imported herbs probably during the Silk uh, Road. And uh, there are a lot of new herbs that are introduced into China, so all these are documented. There's also another book called Ben Chao Gang Mu. 
Okay, this one is written by Li Shizhen during the uh, uh, period around 1518 to uh, 1593 AD. So it consists of uh, 52 volumes, 1892 natural products from minerals, plants, animals, and Fu Fang. Fu Fang means uh, prescri prescription formula. So there'll be a lot of herbs that makes up one formula. So uh, from the period of 1911 to 1950, so 1911 is the time where the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty of China, was overthrown by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. So during this period of time, uh, there are a lot of Western influence. And uh, the Western medication, especially the use of penicillin, has been uh, a great impact during that time. And because of all this new uh, influence from the Western world, uh, the, the people start to have bias against their own Chinese medicine. They find that uh, Chinese medicine is something very old, not applicable, is something that needs to be abolished. So during that period of time, uh, there are a lot of uh, stalemate in the uh, development of Chinese medicine and uh, Western medicine is actually getting more popular. And this is a time also when the knowledge of acupuncture was made more known to other parts of the world when trade started with the European countries. And then from the period of 1950 to 1980, uh, that is during the end of the World War II, which is uh, 1945. And there's also a civil war in China, and that ends in 1950. So with the influence of poor economy after the war, so they have a <coughs> limitation in getting the drugs. So economy and technical limitations have been uh, a, a main concern. So from, from that period onwards, the government re-emphasized the use of TCM. And it, it gradually starts to develop again. And uh, gradual mod modernizations and regulations of both Western orthodox, orthodox medicine and traditional medicine. So in China, actually, it's very unique. At one point, they also retained their Chinese medicine. At a, another point, they also embraced Western medication. So in China, modern society right now, they have hospital that uh, doctors who are trained in both Western and Chinese medicine. So the doctor will uh, use the Western way of uh, diagnosis or Chinese way. Then they can prescribe Western medication at the same time, Chinese medicine. Yeah, so it's a, it's a hybrid. So during the time, uh, they also set up a lot of university all over China, mainly the north, south, east, west, and middle. So they have very well known the university in Beijing, Nanjing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Chengdu. So all these are the main Chinese university offering TCM even now. So from the period 1980s to the 20th century and beyond, uh, modernization of Chinese medicine was initiated by the state administration of the TCM and various other key government organizations. So uh, modernizations of Chinese medicine are in many aspects in terms of education and training, basic medical scientific investigation on the biochemical and physiological aspect of acupuncture, herbal treatment and physiotherapy in terms of qigong, tai chi and massage, they also go into quality control and assurance of Chinese herbs and herbal prescriptions. And they also develop experiment related to TCM principle and Western uh, pharmacological actions of prescription products. Uh, develop, development of modern dosage forms, the efficacy and safety of Chinese herbs and prescription. And the improvement in promoting integrations of Western medication and TCM in particular on the prevention of uh, diseases. 
So TCM is the mainstream as well as the Western medicine. So the hospital in China where there are also only Western medication. There are hospitals where there are solely only uh, Chinese medicine and there are hospitals with uh, integration. So it's up to individual to select which one you want to go. Okay, so that is the earlier development of Chinese TCM in China. So uh, with regards to Singapore, so uh, we also have our own educa edu educational system in terms of TCM. So TCM has been around since the early settlement from uh, uh, immigrants from China. Uh, so the TCM uh, previously was uh, conducted by the Chinese Association, and then later, later they formed college. And initials, uh, if I remember correctly, the early days, they offer like a four-year course. Then after that, uh, they, they increased to four, uh, five years, then six years, and then now it, it has increased to seven years. Seven years is a part-time bachelor course, and five years is a full-time bachelor course. So this course actually is uh, in coll collaboration with the uh, university in China, and the uh, degree is actually offered by China. So in this uh, course, this is a, this is a five-year course, a full-time course, and these are the subjects that you need to study and the course hours that it will be uh, included. So you can see from here is more on the theory, diagnosis, Chinese herbs formula, the, the treatises, all the text, and the internal, external, and then we've also include uh, pediatrics, gyne gynecology, orthopedics. So all these are the new addition of subjects. And, and all this as well, geriatrics. But of course the main one, if you see from the, the hours, you can see from here that the hours, cost hour for the TCM internal medicine constitute the most, because this is the most fundamental foundation. And then of course from here, you see acupuncture and moxibustions, 240 hours, because this is also the essence of TCM. Then the rest is more like uh, just an understanding. Yeah. Herbal medications and preparation, 120 hours. Uh, human anatomy, yes, important. And also we, we also will learn some Western internal medicine and basis of diagnosis so that uh, we can also use this. So uh, besides the TCM, uh, we also include Western medication things like accident and emergency, and medical psychology, yeah. So in terms of practical clinic, uh, clinical practice, uh, they also have to reach certain hours, like in the first year on the second term, 120 hours, second year, first term, and uh, second year, second term, will have to add up to about 300 hours. And total of hours you need is about 1,900 over five years. And the cost fees, okay, it's quite expensive. So for Singapore citizen, we pay about uh, 44,000 plus. For PR, it's about 49,000. And for those students under visa, it's more expensive, it's about 58,000 plus. And on top of that, you still have to pay a registration fee, 600 plus, and general administ administration fee about 2,000 plus. So the conversion rate of Singapore dollar to rupee is about one dollar to forty nine rupees. So it's, it's quite expensive, I would say, over the years. Because uh, the reason why it's expensive because it's a collaboration with the China University. So it's not only income for the local institution; they also have to pay to the China University. So the course that I mentioned earlier on are organized by the local college or association. But in the year 2005, uh, one of our local universities called the Nanyang Technological University 
offer a double degree in biomedical science and Chinese medicine program. So this is also a collaboration with the university and the Beijing University. Uh, but it's not open to students uh, with citizenship from China, Hong Kong, and Macau, and Taiwan. So in this uh, double degree course, more will be emphasized on the biomedical aspect. So for the first year subject, they will have to study all these biological, biology, chemistry, and molecule, you know, something related to bio, biomedical science. Uh, second year, then they will also study uh, a little bit more on the TCM. But most of it is still emphasizing on all the biomedical subjects. And third year, then they start study more about TCM subjects. So the first three years, they were based in Singapore. And then on the fourth year and the fifth year, they will have to go to Beijing University, stay there for two years, and then they will have to uh, uh, blend in with the, the school as well as the practical clinical practice. So these are the subjects that they will study in China. And all these are in Chinese. Yes. Even for the subjects in Singapore, some of it, uh, besides those like uh, biomedical science, which is conducted in English, the rest of the subject that is taught in TCM are all in Chinese. So it's actually a bilingual course. So on the fifth year, these are the subjects. So after they complete the course, they have a better, wider uh, career options. So they, they can either be a TCM practitioner, uh, that's on the basis that they have to pass an exam. Because uh, even if you were to take the courses, whether it's in a university or in a college or association, first of all, you need to pass their school exam. And after that, then you have to sit for the exam conducted by the TCM practitioner board which is under the Ministry of Health in Singapore. So only upon you pass the exam, then you'll be issued a certificate, practicing certificate license. If you fail, then you have to take again the next year. So the career options apart from TCM for them, they can also be uh, biomedical and healthcare research, uh, management and administration in life science. Uh, they can also be a uh, teacher, instructor, and support profession in life science, Chinese medicine, even in sales, engineer, marketing. And they also can handle some law with regards to the patent and intellectual property law. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different path for them because they have two degrees. So they have a wider choice. But for them, I feel like uh, because they, they study the modern uh, biomedical, it's good in one sense, but then if they want to be a TCM practitioner, it could be a hindrance to them as well. Because sometimes in TCM, uh, you have to have a lot of uh, feelings. Sometimes you treat with feelings. It's not just a medical science or something that is science. Because TCM is very unique. Yeah? This from my own perspective. <clears throat> okay, there's also under another course uh, which is acupuncture course, solely on acupuncture. And this is a graduate diploma course for two years. It's a part-time course. And this course is only open to the doctors, the Western doctors, and the dentists who has registered with Singapore Medical Council or the Singapore Dental Council. So upon completion of this course, they will also have to sit for an exam uh, by the TCM practitioner board. So only when you pass the exam, then you can have an acupuncture license. So there are actually two licenses. One is the TCM practitioner license. One is the acupuncture license. So for this course, they can only get the acupuncture license, meaning to say they can only do acupuncture. They cannot prescribe herbs. They cannot uh, uh, give prescription. Whereas the TCM practitioner license, you can prescribe herbs. At the same time, you can also do acupuncture. 
So that's the main difference. So the cost fee for this is about 9,500. And these are the subjects that they study. So for them, they also have to have a basic of the TCM and diagnostic as well as the uh, clinical acupuncture. So in terms of research, uh, there are a lot of uh, research done in uh, TCM herbs, especially in China. There are a lot of reports uh, flooding in, in, in the magazine or even in the, the research uh, institution in China. There are so many. Yeah. So um, a lot of uh, amount of research was conducted on TCM herbs, mostly in categorizing the multi-herbs constitutions. Uh, they tried to isolate the active component in each herbs and try to test their pharmacological activities so that they can come up with new drugs. Okay, for one good example is these uh, herbs uh, called uh, Qing Hao. Uh, it's called Artemisia Enoa, uh, also known as uh, Sweet Wormwood. I think yesterday one of the speakers, the Ayurveda teacher, mentioned about this, this thing called uh, Artasi, uh, called there's this term called artemisinin. Okay, so this artemisinin is an active ingredient derived from this herb. And this herb, actually, uh, it has been used for anti-malaria fever in the ancient China. So there's this uh, scientist called Tu Youyou. Yo. He's the first mainland scientist uh, woman to won the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 2015 for the discovery of this artemisinin, uh, which is made into drug, which has saved millions of people. She's praised for having the knowledge of TCM, but at the same time with the training of biomedicines. And he maintained that she actually got this inspiration from the medical text called Zhou Hou Bei Ji Fang, which is a fourth century, which is written by a fourth century Chinese physician called Ge Hong. So he actually referred to the ancient texts to get inspirations. So with his group of uh, team, they managed to get, extract a substance, artemisinin, from this sweet wood that has been used in the ancient time around 400 AD. However, not uh, just because a compound has natural roots and has long been used in traditional medicine, is no reason to take it lightly. Okay, what, what do I mean by saying this? Although there are a lot of uh, uh, active chemicals in each herbs, but we don't use it individually. We use it as a formula rather. Because in a formula, it's mix, mix up of this concept of jun chen zuo si. So literally it means sovereign, minister, assistant, courier. Okay, so this is the basic principle that we use in Chinese medicine in order to create a formula. Because uh, we seldom use herb by its own. Because they, they are the active ingredient, but there are also other side effects. So normally we use a combination. So this theory has uh, uh, different roles, and the herbs are, according, are arranged according to their physiological contributions. So in terms of sovereign herbs, it represent the major pharmacological efficacy. That's the main one. And then the minister herbs is to support the sovereign herbs in terms of its bioactivity. And the assistant herbs is to reduce the side effect of other herbs. And the courier herbs is to deliver the herbs di directly to the right place, the targeted organs and tissues. So when we come up with formula, we always have this concept in mind. So the efficacy of the herbs will be enhanced and the side effect will be reduced. So for instance, I, uh, I give you an, an example, uh, this uh, medicine called Ma Huang, ephedra. Okay, ephedra have this impact of uh, inducing central nervous system excitement and improve myocardial con contractility. 
And the efficacy can also uh, re re relieve lung congestions, anti-asthmatic, diuretic, anti-perspiration. So uh, <coughs> some people have extracted this uh, these uh, active ingredients called ephedrine and uh, was sold over the counter. And actually a lot of people use that for weight loss as well as to enhance their performance during sports or gym. However, there are a lot of side effects because they just use the herbs solely. So in, in the year 2004, the FDA actually banned this ephedra containing uh, supplement in US because it has caused a lot of side effects to a lot of people including uh, nausea, dizziness, increasing blood pressure and heart attack and strokes and there are also several cases of death <coughs> however there are also some uh, related drugs that is also uh, sell over the counter yeah I've, I've, I have a friend who ever used this before and he told me that after taking this medicine when he go for sports, he's very energized, he's very awake. So it, a lot of them like to use this because it gives them the extra energy and the extra boost. But of course you have to pay a price for that. So in Chinese herbs, we solely use one herbs by itself. But for ginseng, yes, we use ginseng solely. Normally we don't mix with other herbs because ginseng is a very unique herbs because it's a energized medicine. Yes. But apart from uh, ginseng, most of the herbs are used in combinations. So for example, in this formula, we also use ephedrine and uh, uh, we also have other herbs. There's a uh, apricot kernel, uh, gypsum and licorice roots. So if you were to see from this uh, formula, this formula is normally used to treat uh, heat congestions with the lungs, cough, and pneumonia, and some respiratory uh, conditions. So the, the analogy why we use this is, okay, so you see from here the ephedrine is the main, that's the sovereign herbs. And this uh, apricot kernel, actually in TCM we have the effect of uh, going down. It has the effect of drawing down the energy. So this ephedra has the effect of opening up the lungs. And this uh, apricot will help to bring the energy down from the lungs. As uh, this uh, gypsum, it, it has a cooling effect. Gypsum is a kind of mineral. So it will help to cool down the heat in the lungs. And this uh, liquorized roots actually is commonly used to neutralize the toxic of all the medicine. So if you see from this formula, it actually helped to reduce the side effect of ephedra. But at the same time, you still need the ephedra to open up the lungs. So in this formula, there are a lot of uh, thinking to it. And that's the reason why they use this combination. This is a very well-known combination. They only use four herbs, but there are a lot of analogy behind. <clears throat> so having said about all this uh, medicine, uh, we all know that nowadays there are a lot of uh, supplement in the market, and a lot of them are targeting at the concept called antioxidants. So uh, it is said that all these uh, antioxidants can help to offer protection against a lot of diseases including cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and they work by preventing damage uh, caused by free radicals, which is a byproduct of metabolism. So in Chinese, Chinese herbs, because it's plant-based, there are also a lot of antioxidants inside. So a lot of research, they try to target at the supplement market. They try to extract a lot. So for example, in this case, uh, the gochi berry, is very commonly used uh, <clears throat> and uh, in this uh, goji berry it is said it's a super power food yeah and this medicine in century has also been uh, 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 important uh, medicine in Chinese 
and we not only use it as a medicine. In fact, most of our household, when we boil soup, we will also put a bit. So in the Chinese society in Singapore and all over the world, uh, in fact, Chinese herbs is also part of our diet. We will use some for our soup or we will prepare it in terms of food. So in this uh, goat chi, because they have a lot of uh, antioxidants, so uh, in the market they are also targeting and extracting the active ingredients from the goat chi. However, although that uh, antioxidants do have a lot of benefits, but taking too much of it may cause more problems to your health. In fact, there's a study done by uh, some, some uh, other institute other than this clinic. They found that the beta carotene supplement actually raised the risk of mortality significantly and slightly raised the risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah, because I think a lot of the supplement market, they try to extract, like let's say in the case of uh, lycopene, they try to extract and then they magnify it to, to increase the quantity, the, the quantity of the They try to increase the quantity, but then our body is not meant to absorb too much. So if too much is absorbed, then it will cause more problem rather than health. So the best way is to take the food as a whole food instead of supplement. And uh, try to eat the whole things as it is not just the extract, yeah. So moderation is a key word. Okay, uh, in terms of cupping that we use in, in uh, TCM, in the early days we use the bamboo. And then after that it develops to glass so that you can move the glass more smoothly. And then uh, with the modern one we use plastic cupping because plastic cupping is easier to manipulate with the suctions and you can even do it on your own. And then nowadays we have this uh, rubber and glass also, more for beauty. In the, in the early days we used uh, the bamboo for letting blood as well, but uh, bamboo is not a good tool because some of the blood may stain on it. And then subsequently we use glass. But even for glass, sometimes it's very difficult to control the suction. So nowadays we use these uh, plastics. Yeah. So by using this suction, it's easier to manipulate. We also use uh, uh, this cupping f in the case of shingles. Okay, maybe I can show you this slice. This is a shingle treatment in China using cover. Oh, I just got to see you. 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 Oh, I just got to see you.
So in terms of uh, moxibustion, we know that it's from this uh, mudwood plant, and uh, this is how it look like. So we use on the body, on the needles, and then with the modern one, they create into a stand, so that you can actually stick onto the points and burn it. <coughs> they also have a smokeless moxa, so when you burn, you don't have smoke. They come with all this bo moxa box, and you can actually put it on your own, on the back. The moxa stick is stick onto the cylinder box here. But in Singapore, normally we don't use so much of moxa now because uh, the clinic is an aircon environment and we use uh, other alternatives like heat lamp, infra infrared. Okay, <coughs> these are the earliest uh, form of acupuncture from the Pian Shi. And then it evolved to fish bone, animal bone, bamboo needles, and then for the rich one, they have all these bronze, silver, gold needles. <coughs> these are the nine ancient needles that were used previously. Of course, modern usage, we use a stainless steel. Uh, these are some of the needles that we use for bloodletting. But nowadays, we also use the Western way. We use the lancet, hypodermic le uh, needles also for bloodletting. Okay, this is a, a, a bronze uh, model that was used uh, as a teaching material in uh, ancient China. So in this uh, bronze, there are actually a lot of holes, and these holes are actually the acupuncture point. So before, uh, so how is it used? So they will pour water over the, the model, and then they will use a wax to cover up all the points. So in terms of the imperial exam, then they will use the needle and try to target at the points. So if they manage to get the correct points, there will be water flowing out. So if get, they get the wrong points, then too bad. So in acupuncture, we use this electrical uh, stimulator. And also we, we have also developed to like using laser. Acupuncture is commonly used because it saves simple economy and less side effect. But uh, nowadays, there's also another kind of uh, needling called the dry needling. This dry needling is a, a different concept because this one uh, is something that is targeted uh, at specific muscles, uh, trigger points. So this one is quite different from the uh, traditional Chinese acupuncture because traditional Chinese acupuncture is meant to treat the internal organs. But this dry needling is commonly used by physiotherapy to treat some skeletal muscular problem. Acupuncture has also been used in Anastasia. Okay. Okay, maybe I'll show you this very important uh, video. We'd be crazy to write off ancient wisdoms. We ought to question them well, but we can't write them off. Especially when it appears to be able to do something astonishing. In the city's most advanced hospital, 21-year-old factory worker Chun Gunlian has a hole in the heart and her health is deteriorating. She's about to have open heart surgery. Even with the best medical equipment, it's a risky operation. Her chest will be cut open and her heart stopped. But Gunlian will go through all of this without a general anaesthetic. Instead, she's chosen acupuncture. Although sedated by drugs and her chest numbed, she'll be conscious throughout the whole procedure. The doctors stimulate the needles using an electrical current. Yeah. 
As the surgeon begins, the success of the operation depends not just on his skill, but on the power of acupuncture. Acupuncture is an effective painkiller. It's also less damaging to the body than a general anaesthetic. It seems incredible, but Gunlian's doctors have done more than 300 similar operations. Gunlian's operation is entering the most dramatic phase. They check she's okay as they prepare to stop her heart to repair the hole. It seems amazing to me that acupuncture is even considered for such a life-threatening operation. But after two hours of intricate surgery, everything appears to have gone well. Remarkably, just two days after the operation, Gunlian is sitting up in bed, telling her sister the story. Her memories are still vivid. I remember the doctor stuck a needle into my hand and felt my pulse. Then he put another needle in here and here near my vein. Then my whole body started to tremble. When the scalpel started to cut the bone, I could hear it all. But I didn't feel any pain, not a thing. The speed of Gunlian's recovery is impressive. Yeah, so, so actually acupuncture has been uh, used in uh, anesthesia, but then uh, I would say that it's not totally anesthesia free. They will still use a bit of anesthesia, but the dosage is reduced so that the side effect can be reduced as well and the recovery can be faster. <clears throat> so uh, these are the challenges. Okay, maybe one of the, uh, I can talk more about the Singapore context. Huh? So in Singapore, there are actually a lot of uh, TCM clinics and some of the TCM clinics are actually free of charge. For example, there's this, this uh, clinic called Tong Chai Medical Institutions and this actually offer free TCM to regardless of race, religion. Uh, this is the initial one. And then they have developed into a, a more modern one. So they have a different department for fertility, oncology, and so forth. This is a pure TCM uh, clinic. And they have also other branches. And how are they able to sustain with the free medical service? So they have uh, fundraising events and they have uh, buildings they can sublet to, uh, to collect rentals. So they actually spend a lot, nearly 6,000 Singapore dollar per year just to offer this. <clears throat> there are also some other Buddhist uh, 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 related uh, free clinic. And of course you also have those uh, uh, private clinics. So they also run TCM clinics like a massage and treatment at the same time. Of course, there are also some high end whereby they will get the professor from China, and you know there are different degree. So uh, some of the challenges uh, we also face is like the herbs, the source of herbs, because uh, nowadays the herbs, because all the herbs are from China, so uh, the the productions and uh, the way they keep the herbs, and the effectiveness has over the years reduced. So TCM are also uh, faced with more knowledge because cut because a patient will come to you and share with you some other treatments, so you need to have more, more knowledge. And TCM course is, you know, five to seven years old, uh, seven years, and sometimes you have to further studies and 
nowadays courses are more expensive. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself what is the main objective of yourself learning this year. Okay, with that, I think I've uh, exited the time. Yeah, thank you. So with this, uh, we have around six minutes for Q&A sessions, if you have any questions. Question. Uh, in, uh, according to Chinese medicine or Chinese medicine tricks, they're talking about uh, sun jiao or sun, sun cell. Mm. Uh, they have uh, an, uh, specific organs or, or, or only they're talking about energy. Please oh. answer to uh, Chinese and, uh, medical tricks. Uh, okay, actually, actually, this sun jiao. Uh, is a very abstract concept in TCM. Sun Jiao means, the, in English, it means uh, the triple burner. So there are actually three. One is the upper, middle, and the lower burner. So the upper, middle, upper uh, burner, we are actually referring to the organ that is above the diaphragm. So it includes the lungs and the heart. So on the, below the diaphragm, you have all the other organs. And below the belly button, there's also other organs. So we categorize that under the upper, middle, and lower. And of course, if the upper organ, you have those organs, middle, but we don't see it as an organ, we see it as a function. Yeah. So we don't say it's referring to particular organs, but we refer to the functions of the organ. So it's more like uh, the water retention or water getting rid of water functions. So that is how we look at sun gel. It's not referring to particular organs. It's the functions. Yes. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, the speaker. You have made a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I have two quick queries. The first one is related with the cupping. Uh, cupping is in the Chinese system of medicine, or you have taken it from the Uyghur medicine which is existing in China. Cupping has all the while been used uh, not only in Chinese medicine, in uh, Malay traditional medicine, they also use cupping, in fact. Oh, that's true, that's true. Oh. Chinese, the traditional Chinese medicine is nothing but the combination of the various pathies existing in China. Just I wanted to know the origin of the cupping from which system you have taken it. You mean the uh, cupping is taken from which system? Yeah. It's in Chinese system. Chinese, traditional Chinese system itself is a combination of various systems. And you it's a is, sorry, it's, it's a combination of what systems? Various systems existing in the China. Uh -huh. And one of them is the Uyghur, Uyghur system of medicine, which is being practiced in Uyghur area of the China. But I think in the olden days, there are a lot of uh, exchange, a lot of influence. True. So That's if you were to say cupping is from China or from India, or actually... No, no. Uh, it's not from the India, let uh, me tell you. Uh, basically, the Uyghur system of medicine which is existing in the China is nothing, mm -hmm. but it is the uh, Yunani system of medicine which is known over there as the Uyghur system of medicine. Mm -hmm. And the description of uh, uh, in this cupping in Yunani system of medicine is there since last 3000 years. We are using it in this. That's why I'm asking whether you have taken it from Uyghur or we have taken you from Chinese medicine. Uh, this one I'm not too sure, frankly speaking. Yeah, okay. this one I need okay. to do a bit of research on the okay. origin of the cupping. Yeah, right. Right. but from my understanding, there are a lot of traditional medicine that also use cupping. Okay. It's not only exclusive in China, but I think China they use the most because cupping has over the years developed. Like for example, this case, this is also a cupping. Oh, yeah, this I is know, a modern. I know, one. I know, I know. Yeah, uh, a lot of modification you people have made in cupping. That's a wonderful thing. You have the best use of the technology even in the cupping. That's a wonderful thing and uh, really you deserve congratulations for that. And the second question is reg regarding uh, uh, regulations. You know, you have shown a wonderful video in which the cardiac surgery is being performed under the anesthetic effect of uh, just uh, acupuncture. So with that, there, is, there is a regulatory permission 
of such top, uh, such type of uh, things in your country? Uh, not in Singapore because we we don't stress so much on TCM because Singapore uh, ultimately is the in any system, any any country, the such sort of regulatory permission is not there. And cardiac surgery, is such a massive surgery, you know, with uh, you know the thing is the life of the patient is more important than our system or our ego. So we cannot keep the patient under pain without giving the anesthesia. And uh, for that matter, we have to take the permission from the regulatory authority. Sure, sure. So like what I said, this video is actually uh, taken from China. But I have another video that was taken from other Western country. So in yes. China, permission is there? Of course, because like what I mentioned, is an integration of the Eastern and Western. In China, it's a blend. China is very unique because that's the only country where they use Eastern and Western approach in their I medical don't know, system. I don't know. For, as far as my knowledge is concerned, uh, ethics committee, constitution and composition of the ethics committee for all such matters is the same. And the composition is, uh, you know, it, it is recommended by the uh, WHO, not other, no other regulatory authority can give this permission. Yeah, but because every country have different regulations, so it depends. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Your regulations are different in this regard. Okay. But Singapore is uh, mainly based on based on conventional medicine, so not much has been done on the aspect of TCM. Yeah. But in China, yes, a lot. In but having said that, uh, the anesthesia. It's not solely on acupuncture. They also give a minimum dosage. Okay. okay. Yes, so it's not totally all. Uh, prior, to, uh, prior to this surgery, have you conducted some more trials on this issue? Before going for such a massive surgery, have you conducted any trial on animals? You mean uh, the China side? Any side. I mean, you are doing the surgery under the acupuncture uh, anesthetic state. So for that matter, before going for on a, a human being, have you conducted any trial on animals also on this? Uh, most likely, yes. But acupuncture has been used for many years on live body already. So for this anesthesia, of course they have a few trials before they actually do all this. Yes, of course. But why why am I asking this thing? This is some, something Excuse what me, you sir. have... Uh, yeah, just running... me, sir. Just because it's a very important thing. You know, uh, what, whatever you have done, it's a wonderful thing. And if it is discovered, a lot of problem is going to be solved at international level. Of course, because this is a national level thing. Because, see, because China is very unique, like what, what I mentioned. Of course, they have all the regulation, they have all the government on all this issue. So not to worry, they are all taken care by the states. Thank you. Okay, Thank any you. other questions? In any, case, uh, in any case, this is a nice presentation. Uh, sorry, yes, Thank sir. you very Thank much. You. We are running out of time, mm. so we like to uh, thank. Uh, sir, uh, we we ran out of time. Sorry. Uh, no. The uh, uh, that's maybe the last short yeah, short one, please. Uh, uh, yesterday also I heard from our, our Chinese uh, physician. So what I'm interested about the diagnosis uh, process. Uh, yeah, uh, in Tibetan uh, pulse triangulation, we have the same, almost same kind of diagnosis system. But in the, in the position in the second, the middle finger, we have on the right side, uh, it's a little bit different here. So can you little give, explain why it, on the left side is the liver and the left side is spleen? Because we have in the Tibetan diagnosis, on the right side we have the liver, uh, because in the direction, you know. So there's a kind of difference. So can you it will explain on your part what is the reason behind keeping that liver on the left side? Actually, I'm not able to explain this, because all these are written all in the text. Yeah. So of course, uh, in the mid of uh, like uh, in the olden days, where the medical system is influencing to other country, of course some other country they also pick up certain things, but also they change certain things. It's just like uh, <coughs> um, in Vietnam, uh, as far as I know, the the twelve animal zodiac. There's one animal that's different from the China, the China animal. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is. Along the way, there are a lot of influences, but there are a lot of changes also. 
So for that questions, why the Chinese have it on the left and why the Tibetan on the, have it on the right, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Yeah, sorry about that, because it's all in the text. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe, is it a question? No, no question. Can, can you make it a brief one, please? So first thing I would like to tell about uh, Dr. Uh, Raymond Skuri, because in the year 1989, uh, I was sent to China, Peking, under the WHO fellowship. I was there 15 days in the uh, University of Peking, Chinese Traditional uh, Medicine College. There we witnessed uh, uh, surgery that is uh, <coughs> under uh, acupuncture. So in the year 1989, I, I, I personally witnessed this surgery under acupuncture. It was uh, delivering a baby and I, I remember the date also, 3rd of October 1989. So it is being practiced without any minimal anesthesia. They did it with acupuncture only. I was a witness to that. Then for the second question about uh, this thing, uh, liver on the left side, there is a condition as a dextrocardia. Some people, the heart will be on the right side and the other things are, this is a condition as a dextrocardia. Uh, such people are existing still even. Very rare condition. That's why it uh, may be this condition. Thank you. Uh, I would like to maybe let's all thank uh, Dr. Edward Yap for the presentation. Thank you. On highlighting the historical development, the challenges, training practice, and future development in TCM. Thank you. And as a mark of gratitude on behalf of the organizing committee, Professor Robson Tenzin, chairman of uh, organizing committee, would like to present as my mentor to Dr. Edward Yap. Before we leave for the next session, we would like to felicitate Dr. Kumar for his contribution in the cause of recognition of SORIC in India. And for this, we would like to request uh, Geshe Ngawa Samdila, Vice Chancellor of this institute, to present the thank you, Sabina, and to, to say a few words. Uh, taking this opportunity, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, felicitate uh, Dr. Kumarji, uh, who has retired from the ministry, but uh, in the course of uh, recognition of Suarikpa, lots of uh, works uh, had to be done within the ministry. And Dr. Bema Yumriji knows that, uh, who, is, uh, who is also a member uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, committee, and also uh, he has been a member in the Ayush itself. Dr. Kumarji, uh, being advisor uh, from the, to the Siddha, Siddha uh, medical system, uh, was there in the ministry while we were uh, working for the, uh, the recognition, obtaining the recognition. During that time, uh, Madam Anida Dasji and Madam Jaleja ji, uh, at that time, Dr. Kumar took a keen interest and with the dedication, uh, worked uh, tirelessly to move the files and update the data and then do the necessary things which are required at the bureaucratic level. So we know that whenever we visited his office or Madam's office, Madam used to call uh, the, both of the secretaries, the earlier and the later. So he had every updated data with him and the procedures updated, ready to move forward. So with such a dedication, and uh, interest in being a practitioner of Sohar, uh, the Siddha uh, tradition, he has interest in the system. He has uh, uh, you know, dedication and a service uh, for the whole system. So I, we invited him this time to the uh, conference uh, so that uh, all, everybody can appreciate his uh, uh, work. And then uh, on this occasion, we would like to felicitate him. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. This is the great honor for me, 
from the vice chancellor and the community of the Tibetan system of people. And uh, during my tenure, what I thought, this system, it can do wonders in treating the diseases occurring in the high altitude. So it is being there, bits and pieces, without any recognition. See, that was the thing which was going on in my mind. And uh, Vice Chancellor and my previous secretaries, they were the force behind me. See, I am not a single man. They are the forces behind me. Because of them, I am here. So I really thankful to everyone, the audience, and especially the Vice Chancellor and the uh, faculty of this uh, university. And especially uh, some two years ago, when I visited Dharamshala, His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, we had a very audience and he blessed me with everything. That is the biggest moment in my life. So I owe everything on this piece. Thanks a lot once again.